On December 3rd, 1994, Sony launched their first ever video game console, known as the Sony PlayStation, in Japan. North America saw it on September 9th, 1995. Previously, a venture between Nintendo and Sony had gone awry when they tried to make an extension to the Super Nintendo for reading CD-ROM drives, known as the Super NES CD-ROM. After this splitting of ways between Sony and Nintendo started a console war, Sony decided to go their own route focusing less on 3D graphics and more on storable media, which ended up being the de facto standard and still kind of is today. Introduced at $299, not only was it affordable, but it was also fun. Eventually, throughout its life cycle, it sold 102.49 million copies. And today, we're going to dive into the hardware architecture and figure out what it was like to develop on. Hi everybody, I'm James from Zygol Studios, and today we're looking at the Sony PlayStation hardware architecture. The PlayStation was the pet project of Ken Kutaragi. He was a manager of one of the hardware engineering divisions of Sony. He had seen the success of Nintendo and thought that Sony could venture into this area. The Sony PlayStation technically was much more complicated than any other system that was out there other than maybe the Sega Saturn which had launched a week before it. It used a 32-bit RISC CPU of the MIPS R3000 category. This was known as the MIPS R3051. It was clocked at 33.868 MHz. It also included 2 megs of RAM and 1 meg of video RAM. The graphics used a special hardware conglomeration of a geometry transformation engine with 2D rotation and scaling, along with some transparency and fading, and some hardware to do 3D affine texture mapping and shading as well. The maximum resolution was 480i, and of course, since it's Sony, there had to be a sound chip. There was a 16-bit, 24-channel ADPCM. The system was set up into numerous subsystems that could contact each other through different controllers. A parallel and serial connector were connected directly with the CD, the audio, and the video subsystem in order to communicate with each other. The CPU had a 32-bit RISC instruction set. It had one ALU and one shifter, with a five-stage pipeline. For those who don't know, a pipeline is essentially splitting up each sequence of an instruction so that different stages of that instruction can be handled at the exact same time in hardware. This allows for more instruction throughput, and ideally, since there's a five-stage pipeline, there's five stages between the fetch, decode, and the execute of this particular instruction set. So if we can do five stages of the pipeline at a time, that means we can do one piece each and eventually get typical risk instruction throughput of one instruction per clock cycle. There is also a 4K instruction cache and a 1K data cache. The data cache was considered to be somewhat of scratch pad RAM, and the latency was so much less you'd want to use that instead. On the same silicon die, there were two coprocessors. Coprocessor 0 was known as the system control processor. There was a memory management unit and a translational look aside buffer. The geometry transformation engine was the second coprocessor, and it was a math processor which helped with matrix calculation. The biggest downfall of this was it only used fixed point math, and this can be seen in pretty much every Sony PlayStation game out there. However, it still provided a good platform to do these types of calculations. There was also an MDEC, or known as a motion decoder. This would play full motion video. The frames that were encoded would be sent to the MDEC. The MDEC would provide the decoding and then use the DMA to transfer that to the GPU in order to get to the render pipeline. What was pretty amazing about this particular system would require faster data and a big size. And the CPU obviously can't always keep up with the demand. So in order for this to work, the CD-ROM controller, the GPU, the SPU, and the MDEC all had access to the DMA controller and it could take over the main bus whenever it needed. Issuing a command from the CPU to the GPU in order to render was much simpler compared to the Sega Saturn and also even the Nintendo 64. The PlayStation 1 only uses a single frame buffer and had a 64-byte FIFO buffer that would issue commands to the GPU hardware. The GPU uses triangles to form 3D models. This is much like how 2D games are formed. In 2D games, they're just flat polygons. In other words, two triangles can join to form a different shape. The GPU has hardware to handle this. This data is then issued to that 64-byte command FIFO buffer, and then is issued to the GPU, which then eventually does the calculations and then sends it off to the frame buffer. The 64-byte command FIFO buffer could be issued a set of commands. These commands would essentially state how and where to draw a single shape. Once the commands were received, the GPU was intelligent enough to add some clipping in, and essentially this would skip over operations that were outside of the user's viewpoint. 
Apart from this, there were also some shading effects that could be potentially used. One was a flat shading, so allowing for one particular level of light or color on a particular object. Or ground shading, where a specified vertex could have its own particular level, and then it's lurped in between the points, or interpolated. And finally, on top of the surfaces, you had textures in order to make things look a little more detailed. The GPU was able to perform a fine texture mapping. This would overlay over the primitives as well as the shaders. This technique only requires two dimensions. This is why PlayStation 1 games look so different, especially on HD televisions. There's something called dithering in order to blend colors better together with this affine texture approximation. Dithering in signal processing refers to changing a frequency to not operate within the same exact frequency within a certain period of time. Dithering has many other applications outside of what the PS1 used it for, such as a spread spectrum approach to some type of radio signal, but in this case it applied a better smooth transition between colors. With this stuff piped in, you had 1 megabyte of VRAM in order to send directly to the frame buffer. The VRAM could allocate a frame buffer of about 1024 by 512 pixels with 16-bit colors. It's pretty amazing. However, there were a few issues. While 1024 by 512 was a pretty impressive stat at 16-bit colors, that really didn't fit the build with a lot of modernized TVs at the time. So in order for this to be compatible with modern TVs, it needed to be scaled down. And the PS1 GPU was limited in hardware to draw up to frame buffers only at 640 by 480, which eventually was the limit of what the resolution could be. You were also able to decrease the depth of the frame buffer in order to use those resources for other things. The biggest downside to the PlayStation GPU was the fixed point unit issue. The problem is, in a 3D environment, X, Y, and Z need to be determined with fairly decent accuracy in order for things to be displayed on screen correctly. Floating point numbers have their own standard, and they're not as simple as a binary translation into a hexadecimal number, and they're able to have a little bit better precision. Without a floating point unit, the PS1 had to approximate floating point using fixed point math by either using multiplication or addition tricks in order to get the resolution that was needed. This means that there's some error of approximation based on the same calculations you would do with a floating point number. So this means that the precision is less. So movement and mapping on the screen would be much less apparent. So jagged edges and sometimes stuttering of models was pretty apparent. The sound processing unit, or the 24 channel PCM, allowed for a 44 1K CD stereo quality audio output. This was pretty amazing. Pair this with the CD-ROM and you can store a lot of audio and music data and play it at great audio quality. It allowed for your typical modulation, envelope, looping, and reverb effects. 512 kilobytes of SRAM were provided as the audio buffer, which is tremendous. Finally, the I.O. design is done using serial communication, as per the standard of this typical time. The memory card and the controller both have the same physical port. The port was actually altered by Sony in order to prevent collisions on the bus. Each particular controller or memory card had their own UIDs or unique identifiers in order for programmers to determine which one was which. Sony also had a technique for anti-piracy and region lock, but that's for another video. The typical language of choice was C. Although most developers used MIPS assembly in order to operate a lot of these peripherals together, C was still the language of choice as pretty much all consoles of this generation used anyway. So not only could you write fast C code, but you could get some pretty awesome results out of the PlayStation 1. I hope you all learned something today, and appreciate the architecture of the PlayStation 1 a little bit better. This was a pretty amazing system, and the sales speak for themselves. This is James from Zygal Studios, signing off.